Good evening, and welcome to the Mill Valley Historical Society's First Wednesday Speaker Series, an event we host the first Wednesday of every month. My name is Deborah Schwartz, and I'm on the Board of Directors for the Mill Valley Historical Society, in charge of the Oral History Program and the First Wednesday Speaker Series. It's my hope as director for this speaker series to bring you an array of historical topics to explore. Last month, it was the history of Mount Burdell with Ranger Mike Warner. And tonight, we refocus our lens to the aquatic with Pat Broderick's presentation about ghost ships at the San Francisco Bay. Also with us tonight is Franklin Walder from the Mill Valley Public Library. You can't see him, but he's the man behind the curtain helping to keep things running smoothly. Thanks, Franklin. And of course, we want to thank the, the Mill Valley Public Library for allowing us to host our speaker series in this safe and accessible format. Before we begin, I want to say to those of you in the audience who are already members of the Mill Valley Historical Society, thank you for your generosity and interest. Your membership allows us to continue our efforts to infuse history into the present through speaker presentations, oral interviews, history walks, history crafts, and the collaboration to restore and return to Mill Valley engine number nine, the last remaining locomotive from the Mount Tamapaya Scenic Railway. For those of you who are not yet members, please join us. Membership ensures that you will be alerted to future talks such as tonight's and our annual walk into history that takes place on Memorial Day weekend. I believe we will soon be restarting from the beginning, Chuck Oldenburg's charming Mill Valley history vignettes via email. And you will be updated about other historical events in our town and nearby. Membership to our organization is so affordable and just a click away on the Mill Valley Historical Society website. For practical purposes, the audience must be muted for this webinar, but functional tools are located at the bottom of your screen to help us communicate with each other. And if you can't see them now, just hover your cursor over the area and they should appear. Now look for the chat icon. That also allows you to post comments, say hello to friends, and we encourage you to add substantive information during this presentation. Now look for the Q&A option. The Q&A option is where you can post questions you may have about tonight's presentation, and I'll address those questions to Pat after his talk. Pat, if you have comments for personal st or personal stories to share, the chat room is the best place for that. Three, four. Tonight's talk will last about an hour, and after we'll take time for questions and comments from the audience. This event is being recorded and will be available on the Mill Valley Historical Society website in about three or four days. Just go to the website, click events, select First Wednesday Lecture Series, and you'll find tonight's recording as well as many others. It's autumn now and so close to Halloween. Are you thinking that ghost ships are something out of Pirates of the Caribbean movies where dead crews on dilapidated ships are on a dark and endless sail to nowhere? No. Tonight we focus on a different kind of ghost ship, many of them hidden in plain sight. How many shipwrecks lie scattered on the floor of the bay or in nearby waters or landfill? Few of us are aware of these relics from San Francisco's maritime past many forgotten for a century or more. Yet every day, Bay Area residents pass over long buried ships. Some Muni, Muni riders even tunnel through a ship on their daily commute. This evening's talks will visit some of the steam schooners, gold rush ships, Golden Gate wrecks, and the US Navy ships that remain forever ghosts in our waters, if not in our memories. Pat Broderick is the retired Santa Rosa Junior College English Department Chairman. He's been sailing on San Francisco Bay since 1971, chartered boats in Washington and Mexico, transited the Panama Canal and placed first in the 2010 Pacific Cups Division, a race to Hawaii. 
He has sailed thousands of sea miles, raced in hundreds of races on San Francisco Bay and the Pacific Ocean. He sails a wily cat 30 named Nancy, his wife's name. Along with sailing and racing, Pat has served as Commodore of the Single-Handed Sailing Society, Chairman of the Yacht Racing Association of Northern California, Race Director at the Sausalito Yacht Club and Sausalito Cruising Club. He is the United States Sailing Association Race Officer and has held a Coast Guard Captain's License. Pat became interested in sailing history as a landlocked farm boy in Oregon and has continued that interest through reading, visiting maritime museums, interviewing experienced sailors, and writing articles for Latitude 38, Yacht Club sailing publications, newspapers, and online blogs. In particular, she is interested in sailing history concerning the San Francisco Bay Area. And Pat's late friend Garland Sloan shared his Young Navy corpsman's story of surviving the sinking of the USS Benevolence just a few miles beyond Land's End at the mouth of the Golden Gate, Pat started researching other ships that sank or were bur buried in the San Francisco Bay and nearby Pacific Ocean, and there are thousands. Same. So, won't you please give a warm welcome to Patrick Broderick. Here we go. Uh, ghost talks of San Francisco Bay and nearby areas. Uh, thanks for inviting us, uh, Doug, Doug Ford, my uh, partner in uh, sailing and in technology, is here beside me helping me. Uh, tonight we're going to visit some places we take for granted, which contain hidden relics of the Bay's past, uh, fleets of ghost ships that came to San Francisco Bay and never left. I hope by the time uh, the program ends, you'll be more aware of what you're sailing past or over or walking by or driving or even riding uh, Muni through. It all began in, 18, in 1775 when Captain uh, Ayala sailed the Spanish packet San Carlos through what we now call the Golden Gate, becoming the first European to uh, discover in quotation marks, San Francisco Bay. Since 1775, the Bay has become a major world port and U.S. Navy center. In that time, hundreds of ships have completed their final voyage on the rocks, beaches, beneath the water, under the ground, remaining part of our great port, hidden from view, yet many of them in plain sight, especially with a modern underwater exploration technology. We're going to go through uh, uh, three categories of the ghost ships tonight. We're going to look at Sausalito and Point San Pablo steam schooners, gold rush ships, and Navy ships. The steam schooner, the late 19th, early 20th century coastwise steam schooner, was a workhorse. About 240 steam schooners uh, were. Um, Built, uh, many of them up in the Northwest, brought down to San Francisco uh, where they were fitted out with engines and other things. And they spent their lives hauling uh, lumber from the Northwest and the North Coast to San Francisco and as far as Los Angeles. Many of them had cabins for transporting passengers and they also hauled merchandise back up the coast uh, long before roads and railroads punched through to all of those little villages and dog holes where the mills existed. So we're going to start with a history of just one, and that's the steam schooner Seafoam. Uh, she was constructed in 1905 in Aberdeen, Washington. Uh, she had a 500 horsepower compound steam engine that was installed in San Francisco Union Ironworks. Uh, she could carry 800,000 board feet of timber uh, in her hold and on her deck. Uh, Seafoam also had the cabins for passengers and a day room uh, and a galley for them to sit in and to eat from while they went on their way back and forth. She spent most of her life sailing along the Marin, Sonoma, Mendocino coastlines. Seafoam continued these weekly trips uh, into these dog hole ports until February 23rd of 1930. One when in a heavy fog, she foundered at Point Arena, 
with a full cargo of lumber. The crew and passengers are rescued by the Coast Guard, but because she was filled, as you see in the picture here, with lumber, she continued to float and eventually washed ashore. Uh, here's a um, painting of sea foam, uh, and here's a manifest of cargo uh, that she carried uh, from San Francisco uh, to Mendocino, uh, and it, it contains a list of all the things that you would need to run a household, to uh, run a sawmill, uh, to feed, to clothe, and to take care of all of those people. Uh, talking about passengers, here is Seafoam uh, boarding passengers at Mendocino. Uh, it's nice that the gentleman hanging on the outside gave up his seat to one of the ladies sitting in the box, but it kind of calls into question <laughs> the um, safety of, uh, of um, the, the trip. And here is Seafoam at uh, Point Arena after uh, she washed ashore. And here is Seafoam breaking up uh, at Point Arena. So what happened to all of the steam schooners? Well, roads came, highways punched their way through, the railroad was built all the way to Eureka uh, and out to the coast, and the steam schooners uh, began uh, to lose their traffic, lose their business, uh, and they ended up, uh, many of them as derelicts in Oakland Creek. Uh, now we're gonna talk about steam schooners at uh, Point San Pablo. Uh, Captain Raymond Clark, who founded the Richmond uh, San Rafael Ferry and was a captain of the ferry boat Charles Van Dam, which ended its days in Sausalito at Bridgeway and Gate 5 Road as the Ark. Some of you might remember those with hippies and, uh, and, and others. Uh, ran on the side of fishing, uh, uh, fishing business where he rented a dinghy for <clears throat> two bucks a day and sold a bucket of bait for a quarter and then towed you out of Richmond around the corner to Point, Sablo, Point San Pablo. It was a long tow and uh, it was difficult. So he decided that building a marina or a harbor uh, at Point San Pablo would make business quicker. Uh, he didn't have the money to haul a lot of rock in and piling and things like that, but there were these derelict steam schooners sitting in Oakland Creek and here you see what he did. Uh, he uh, borrowed, he, he bought uh, seven of the boats and hauled them around and sank them uh, to form the San Pablo Harbor. Uh, as the <clears throat> space between the boats silted up, uh, they began to disappear. Here's an aerial shot. Uh, you can see the marina he built on the left side, and you can see the tops of the various ships that he brought in to create his marina. Uh, this is a picture uh, right after World War II when the ships were still uh, in evident. As you look out there, you can see the marina. Uh, the San Pablo Yacht Club was in, uh, invented uh, to take advantage of the um, location. And now all Captain uh, Clark had to do was to tow the boats out a short distance and when the sturgeon were running or the uh, striped bass, uh, people would go out and fish until they got tired. They'd hold an oar up, it would be seen from the shore, they'd send a launch out and tow you back in. And today, by the way, Point San Pablo Harbor is the pickup place for the East Brother Light Bed and Breakfast, a part of the East Bay Park system. and. Uh, if you haven't spent a night out there, just check it out. A uh, great place to go on anniversaries and other events. Uh, there's a chocolate under the pillow and uh, on the dresser by the, by the bed, uh, some uh, earplugs because it is still a working lighthouse. <laughs> but it's a great, great adventure. Uh, in Sausalito, Herb Madden decided to follow suit. So in in 1940, he bought three of the ships and brought them over and they formed the south end of the downtown harbor in Sausalito. 
One was the Wellesley, uh, which had been anchored off of uh, Sausalito in Richardson's Bay in what was then a rotten row that would be a congregation of ships that were rotting away. Hard to think of Sausalito as a place where ships rotted away, but they were. Uh, and so in uh, 1944, 1942 rather, they were hauled in, they were lined up, uh, they were sunk, uh, and they formed the, the south end of the uh, marina. In 1944, they had deteriorated badly enough that the decision was made to burn them. And the mayor of Sausalito had the honor. Uh, they were doused with kerosene and he fired a flare into them and they lit on fire. Unfortunately, uh, one of them uh, had not been, his, one of them, the fuel tanks had not been unloaded and the ship exploded in the flames. It burned all night and all of the authorities uh, from one end of the bay to the other thought that saboteurs had come in and were blowing up Marin ship uh, the shipyard at the north end of Richardson's Bay, which was busy cranking out uh, tankers and freighters for the war effort. Uh, if you ever dine at the Spinnaker restaurant in Sausalito, uh, you drive right over three steam schooners. And by the way, two of them went into that area, complete with steam engines and boilers and all of their equipment. So you're driving over that as well. Uh, and here's a picture of the parking lot leading out to the Spinnaker restaurant and the cars are sitting on the hulks of early 20th century uh, steam schooners. Now we come to the gold rush. Everyone knows about the gold rush. Uh, in 1847, six ships in total called uh, at the port of, I'm going to call it San Francisco, uh, Yerba Buena then, but San Francisco, six ships in the entire year. In August of 1849, more than 70 ships arrived, uh, and that was the way things went after the gold rush. Every month, between 60 and 70, 80 ships arrived uh, because people were desperate to get to uh, California and the gold fields. Here's a, a political cartoon of the day. Uh, you can see people taking rocket ships, flying in dirigibles, uh, jumping into the water to get on board this ship, which is off to San Francisco. Once the ships got to San Francisco, um, most of them, many of them, uh, had their crew and, and officers abandon the ship and head for the gold country as well, which resulted in Yerba Buena Cove, which is now the downtown uh, area, business area of, of San Francisco, being clogged with uh, ships uh, that were, uh, again, in disrepair and rotting away. Uh, these pictures, uh, here's uh, uh, Audubon, John Audubon uh, was out and he drew a, a picture of, of the ships. There were fires uh, and one of the things that the uh, people in San Francisco did uh, was to use ships as uh, warehouses, as hotels, and other purposes. Uh, and here we have uh, the Niantic. Uh, in 1849, Niantic arrived in San Francisco and stayed. It was sold and converted into a two-story hotel. You can see the drawing here. Uh, the bottom, uh, the hull became a bar and they built a building on top of the Niantic and you can see another ship just down the line from Niantic. Not at all unusual. Uh, there are a, an estimated 40 or more ships buried under the business district and each time they dig down for the foundation of a new building, they come across uh, an unexpected find. Here is Niantic's stern and part of the rudder. Niantic lies under the Transamerica Garden, uh, what's left of it. But when they, when they excavated there, they, they saved this, this portion of the ship 
and it's in the Maritime Museum in San Francisco where you can go and see it. The General Harrison is a ship that was converted into a store ship. They cut doors in the uh, hull. Uh, they installed derricks to hoist things in. Uh, and it became essentially uh, a landlocked warehouse. And here is the General Harrison today. When uh, they were excavating, they came across the wreck. Uh, the, the rear uh, 40 feet of the boat is under the foundation of the building next door, but you can see that uh, what's left is really in very good shape. Uh, it's, it's said by the people who excavated it that they could still smell the, the scent of wine from the cases of wine and champagne that had been stored uh, in the uh, General Harrison. Uh, after the uh, after they finished with their uh, excavation, it was filled back in, and uh, it was uh, <clears throat> above it is the uh, uh, club quarters hotel. Uh, so in a way, you can still sleep on a gold rush ship. You're just not in the ship. You're a few feet above it in a in a very expensive hotel room. Um, Another thing that happened was they were used for fill. Uh, this picture shows a couple of interesting things. The square things you see, rectangular things you see, are called water lots. They are pieces of property which were sold to somebody, uh, and that somebody came down and marked them out by putting uh, a, a fence around them. Uh, the problem was that it was illegal to fill that area with uh, dirt, but it was okay to uh, fill it with a ship. And so uh, what would happen is one of these derelict ships would get sold to um, someone and it would be hauled into their property where it would be sunk. And once it was sunk, uh, it became part of the land, of course, and then it became legal to continue filling the space. And a lot of old downtown San Francisco exists that way. Uh, there's a, the old ship saloon, for instance, which uh, is alleged to have been built on a, on a ship that was, that was sunk there. Uh, the uh, Rome <clears throat> is a ship with a history having to do with Muni. Uh, in 1994, they were digging the tunnels to put Muni under uh, Market Street uh, when they ran into a ship. Uh, and after some uh, exploration, they determined it was the Rome. Uh, they did uh, what they could to preserve what was uh, artifacts, but it was uh, not on in the books to do anything more. So uh, if you ride uh, the Muni down by Justin Herman Plaza, you can't see it out the window, but you are literally riding uh, the rails through the bow section of a gold rush ship. Here is the Candace, uh, an 1818 uh, three-masted bark, uh, corner of Spear and Folsom. Uh, this is an example of a ship being broken up before it was filled in. Uh, many of the ships, uh, instead of being sunk and filled in, were dismantled and taken apart with the wood uh, being used for building, canvas being used for tents, and of course, all of the metalwork, the, the, the various blocks and the uh, winches and all of the stuff, uh, sometimes finding its use in the gold country uh, other times finding its use some other way. And one of the breaking yards that existed essentially were uh, the, uh, the Bay Bridge, the Rincon Rock where the Bay Bridge meets San Francisco. Uh, Charles Hare is one of those men. He broke up at least 77 ships between 1850 and 1859. Uh, and there were two or three other breakers nearby who usually employed Chinese laborers to do the dirty work. Here's a map of the buried ships that have been identified. 
uh, you can see them, uh, they line, many of them line up with the, the street because when they were sunk, they were sunk on a piece of property that was that later was adjacent to the street, which had already been plotted under the water on the way out to filling uh, the cove. Uh, you'll also find in on the sidewalks down there, uh, bronze plaques which identify where the ships are, what you're standing on, uh, and uh, what the names of the ships were. Okay, that was enough about uh, gold rush ships. Uh, they, they will continue to find ships as they do more excavation in that part of San Francisco as they, as they continue to build up. My friend Doug, who is sitting next to me and helping me with the technical side, is a docent at the uh, Maritime Museum. And he tells me uh, somewhere in San Mateo, uh, down the peninsula, there's a secret warehouse stashed with thousands and thousands of artifacts which have been recovered from these ships that have been dug up. And you can see some of them at the Maritime Academy. Moving on, uh, we're going to go to the U.S. Navy. And we're going to start with the USS Conestoga. Uh, USS Conestoga uh, started its life as a private uh, company towboat on the East Coast towing uh, coal barges back and forth. But in 1918, when the United States entered World War I and found itself woefully short when it came to Navy things, bought the boat, uh, put a five inch gun on, a uh, three inch gun rather, up there on the foredeck and converted it to a Navy tug called USS Conestoga. In 1920, she was transferred to the West Coast. Conestoga was about 170 feet long, carried a crew of 56, and as I say, was armed with that uh, three inch gun on the foredeck, or uh, in front of the uh, cabin. In 1921, in 1921, Conestoga departed Mare Island uh, sh Naval Shipyard towing a barge filled with coal, uh, headed for Honolulu, and then she was going to go on to Samoa, where that was going to be her next station. Uh, after clearing land's end, the USS Conestoga disappeared into history. Uh, with the only evidence of her loss of barnacle encrusted lifeboat with a faint sea painted on it that uh, was found near uh, Manzanillo, Mexico of, uh, a year later. After a month when the ship had not arrived in Hawaii, the Navy thought Conestoga had foundered near her Hawaiian destination, mounted an extensive search with over 60 naval vessels uh, the aircraft to the day, searching 300 square miles of the area with no success. The uh, search, however, oh, here, uh, let me give you this. This is the uh, crew picture of Conestoga. Uh, you'll see a couple of uh, black sailors at the top. Uh, they, of course, were involved in the galley, cooking and, and serving the officers on the boat. So here's the, the projected course. They left Norfolk, Norfolk. They stopped in Guantanamo Bay. Uh, they went through the Panama Canal. They made a stop in uh, Mexico, San Diego, and ended up at Merrill Island. And then you have the dotted line leading from sort of the middle down towards the left corner, which was the projected course to uh, Hawaii. Well, the bizarreness, this is a submarine. <laughs> this is R4. Submarines of the day, did not have names, they were given num their numbers. And remember that submarines have always been boats. Even in today's world, the large atomic uh, submarines are not ships, they're boats. And here you have the crew. And if you look carefully, you'll see the sail. Uh, R4 was searching for Conestoga uh, when it had a complete electrical failure. Everything shut down and they couldn't start the uh, engine. And so the captain ordered uh, battery covers and other things, big pieces of fabric sewn together and they, they made sails out of them. They hooked them onto the uh, torpedo derricks, 
fore and aft and onto the periscope. And uh, R-14 sailed 100 miles from where it was into the port of Hilo. Uh, and it's probably the only sailing submarine that's ever existed. Uh, the uh, crew, as you can see here, don't seem too concerned about the fact that they're, uh, <laughs> that they're sailing instead of motoring. Uh, and they kind of look young too, don't they? Uh, well, what happened to Conestoga? In 2009, NOAA conducted a survey of wrecks in the Gulf of the Farallones, and they found an unknown wreck approximately 200 feet long, just a few miles south of the southeast Farallon. Uh, and this is the sonar picture of that uh, image. Uh, they sent uh, a, ro a rover uh, down to take a look. And the picture at the bottom of the screen is a picture it came back with. It's a picture of a three inch naval gun. And the top picture shows the very same gun with its gun crew, which confirmed that it is uh, USS Conestoga, and they never got further than the Southeast Farallon Island, let's say something like 30 or 35 miles off the coast. It's conjectured they were overcome uh, in a, by the storm uh, that, was that was around at that time and uh, foundered. It's, by the way, a secret where the location is because it's a naval uh, cemetery. Uh, and the government doesn't want uh, people diving down to, to get artifacts. USS Thompson. Thompson was a Clemson class four stack destroyer laid down in the end of September in 1918 at the Bethlehem Union Iron Works in San Francisco uh, as part of the war effort. Uh, commissioned in 1920, of course, long after World War I ended. Uh, she uh, spent 10 years on the coast and uh, in the Pacific uh, in various kinds of exercises, uh, including laying smoke, because before radar, in order to obscure uh, the firing of an enemy uh, force, uh, destroyers uh, just made a smoke screen. Uh, it also uh, was involved in the Point Honda uh, disaster when a fleet of uh, destroyers left San, San Francisco for a fast trip to San Diego to see how fast they could do it. And in the fog, uh, the commander of the fleet made a bad decision thinking that he had uh, found the mouth of uh, the, the Channel Islands. Instead, he found Point Honda and eight of the destroyers uh, ran aground uh, with uh, some loss of life. Thompson was lucky because she was near the rear of the fleet and heard the sirens and the, and the bells going off, uh, knew something had happened, slowed down and avoided running up onto the rocks. In 1930, uh, the United States signed uh, a, uh, treaty, international treaty, limiting the tonnage of uh, ships. Uh, and as part of that, they got rid of a lot of obsolete ships, including uh, Thompson. Here she is at Mare Island being decommissioned. You can see that they've taken the guns off the bow. They've taken down most of the uh, structure, uh, the cabin structure, uh, getting ready to scrap it. But instead of being scrapped, uh, it was bought by uh, an entrepreneur towed to Redwood Creek in San Mateo County where a dance hall was built on the decks. Uh, it was kind of a watery roadhouse because with prohibition there was probably some uh, booze going on. Uh, in 1944, the U.S. Navy repurchased Thompson because they needed a target ship towed the Hulk out to the mudflats uh, between Redwood City and Hayward uh, and uh, scuttled it. And it became a target for Navy training pilots uh, practicing dive bombing. Uh, and uh, here you have a picture of uh, bombs being dropped on uh, 
on the on the ship and the planes used a m23 practice bomb that looked like this uh, i have one in my hand but i don't think you can see it uh, it's hollow and in the mount in the in the left end as you see it uh, a 10 gauge uh, sh flare shell was inserted uh, where you see a little dimple there there was a uh, mechanism uh, attached a wire mechanism so that when the bomb hit something uh, a firing pin punched into the shell and out of the back end of the uh, bomb uh, smoke appeared that way the uh, airmen as they dropped the bombs could be judged as to where the bomb hit whether it hit the ship or not there are this weighs about uh, three pounds when it's fully uh, with the with the flare inside there are probably thousands and thousands of these buried in the mud in that in a circle around where thompson is today uh, and this is thompson today uh, the barge at the bottom has been dragged out at some point and, and uh, also sunk there but this is uh, the ship at, at low tide what's left of it and uh, today it's a rendezvous point for uh, kayakers about two miles out there and on a calm day you can kayak from redwood city out and and uh, see what's left of the world war two world war one simpson class uss thompson moving on the henry berg was a victory ship built at richmond in one of kaiser's shipyards there and launched in 1943 she was one of 33 Liberty ships converted to troop transport designed to carry 564 ships. Uh, in 1944, uh, the SS Henry Berg was returning to San Francisco from Hawaii, overloaded with about 1,400 souls in, uh, aboard, all of them happy to be just a few hours away from Frisco uh, from uh, the international zone for the enlisted men and maybe Sally Stanford's club uh, in Pacific Heights for the officers. They were so happy that alcohol appeared and someone's record player was set up on the foredeck for an impromptu celebration. On a very foggy day in the Gulf of the Farallones, what could possibly go wrong? Plowing ahead at max victory boat speed, about 11 knots, the record player blasting, troops yelling and shouting and convorting, the captain on the bridge failed to hear the whistle on the southeast Farallon Island. And then he did, just moments before the berg plowed into the drunken uncle islets, which are about 200 yards off the southwest corner of the island. Uh, here is Berg aground uh, off the, uh, the Farallon Island behind it. Uh, the troops, even though they'd been celebrating, were disciplined, the sailors, and using the eight lifeboats from the ship, they managed to transfer everyone from uh, the, the ship to the island, where they were later picked up by uh, other smaller boats and taken to San Francisco a little bit later than they planned. Uh, and the ship began to break up. Uh, and uh, the, the, the Berg, or what's left of the Berg, is still there at the southeast corner of, uh, southwest corner of the Farallon Island. Uh, arriving back in San Francisco, you can see the true uh, sailors are dressed in uniform because none of them got wet on the way from the ship to uh, the island. They, they all managed to go uh, in, the, in the lifeboats. And now we come to our last ship, which is uh, USS Benevolence. Uh, and uh, rather than me tell the story, uh, I'm going to allow my late friend, Garland Sloan, uh, who was a young uh, naval seaman corpsman aboard the USS Benevolence AH-13 uh, to tell his story. The fact that the Red Cross is sinking may give you a kind of clue as to what you might find. So now I'm going to turn the, the uh, program over.
Hi everybody, I'm Garland Sloan, and I want to talk to you a little this evening about uh, the sinking of the hospital ship USS Benevolence just off the coast of California on August 25th, 1950. But first, I'd like to take just a very few minutes to talk just very briefly about the history of the Benevolence. About May of 1945, she began making trips from Yokosuka, Japan, and Japan, and uh, Saoting, China, uh, transporting patients from there to the San Francisco area to various hospitals in uh, Oak Knoll Hospital in Oakland, Maryland Navy Hospital, and the Army Hospital in San Francisco. And she made many trips back and forth between uh, Japan and China and San Francisco. And in uh, May 45, she went, she sailed over to where, to uh, Bikini Atoll, where the first atomic bomb tests were being made, uh, first since World War II. And she was there as a hospital for the people working on that, on those tests. After that, she continued making trips back to the mainland, to the United States, until uh, late 1946. Then in September 1947, she was sailed to Mare Island, where she was uh, decommissioned, put into uh, mothballs, as they call it. And uh, first part of August in 1950, I was transferred to the, to, from Oak Knoll Hospital in Oakland again. I was transferred to the Benevolence along with many other people over the next week came on board to start putting her back into commission for intended, intended use off the coast of Korea. Then, then uh, we were at all, had completed all our work to get her in, into shape for sea duty. And on a return from our final shakedown cruise on August 25th, uh, in the late in the, eve in the afternoon evening, we were in a collision with the SS Mary Lukenbach. It was a, a, a merchant marine tanker, our freighter, not tanker, bound for Pennsylvania. And we collided head on and uh, the, the, the Mary looking back actually tore a hole out of the port side of the, of the benevolence just after the bow, a, a hole about five feet wide and 40 feet long, which let the water into her pretty, pretty fast. Uh, many of us were in the mess hall having our evening, evening meal. When this happened, there were, there were many other people still in the chow line coming to eat. And we had no idea what, what, what had happened. We didn't know what had caused the explosive sound of the collision. Uh, but immediately the order came over the speaker system, all hands prepare to abandon ship. So we did, uh, leaving the mess hall, there was a little stairway about two and a half or three feet wide to get up to the next deck. And we very orderly and quickly as we could got up there and up out on weather deck. And my buddy Horton and I uh, located the, the uh, life jacket locker. We had no, none of us had been issued life jackets yet. And uh, I can't explain that, but we, we, we were not. So we got the life jacket, got the old World War II KPOC life jackets and uh, Horton and I stood in the doorway, passing them out as people came came down the passageway, headed for the uh, upper deck. And uh, when when there seemed to be no more people coming, Horton and I each grabbed a life jacket and made for the weather deck. And by the time we got up there, the ship had listed so far to the port that we could actually walk on the side of the ship. And we, along with many, many other people, sat along the side of the ship, still un not knowing what had happened. 
because the uh, looking back had, had had backed off and and steered around us, and had actually anchored off our stern, but we didn't even know she was there. We had no idea what was going on. It was foggy; you couldn't see anywhere. So we sat there wondering uh, how, how, if there was any boats coming, if we were going to go down with the ship or what was going to happen. And uh, we, we couldn't see land, of course. We couldn't, even though it was only about three or four miles out from, from the coast, uh, we couldn't see anything except water and fog. It began to feel like she was going to sink right now. So Horton and I both started preparing to leave the ship. We put our life jackets on. I took my white hat off and folded it and put it under my jumper. And, and I took my shoes off, tied them together with strings and with their strings and hung them around my neck. Now, to this day, I have not figured out what in the world I thought I was going to do with those shoes after this was all over. But it didn't matter because it, not too long after I went in the water, I lost my shoes anyway. So we swam as fast as we could away from the ship. And I, we were probably at least 200 yards away from it when we looked back and finally she did go under the, under the surface and was out of sight. And um, so we swam and, and as we swam on through the, through the night, it was dark by then, uh, we came up on other people all uh, everywhere. We kept coming across somebody. And any time we did, we would latch on to them and all of us would hang on to each other with one hand and swim with the other. Those old K-pop life jackets, we, we swore that if you threw one in the water by itself, it would sink. But uh, they, they did not sink with us in them. And they, they kept us afloat, sort of. Our heads, heads were bobbing out of the water a lot into the water. Uh, as, as time went on, the person next to me turned out to be our Catholic chaplain from the benevolence, uh, Father Reardon. And uh, as we were swimming along during the night, dark, couldn't see anywhere, I thought a little levity might be good. And I said, where you go, I go, Father. I'm going with you. <laughs> so he said, come along. And we, we kept swimming. And uh, there was a fishing boat uh, skippered by John Angelo Napoli. The, the name of the boat was Flora. I'll never, never, never forget that name. And he came alongside, found out that her, we, by that time we had 14 people. We had one nurse and 13 other uh, seamen and medical personnel. So he, when he came alongside, he immediately shut his engine and put ladders over the side so we could climb on board. And we climbed on board and got up out of the cold water. But then we were in the cold wind because we were wet, of course. And, uh, but when he got all, actually he picked up 70 people that night, our 14 and, and subsequently uh, several more. And when he, that was all he could get on his boat, he took us to the Mary Looking Back, which he knew where that was. <laughs> and with stretchers and lines, they transfer, transferred us from, from the flora up to the deck of the, of the uh, Looking Back. And uh, we stayed there until sometime, uh, I'm not sure what time, it was still dark, but it was in the wee early morning hours. An army tug came uh, from San Francisco, came out to the ship and picked up uh, a lot of us and took us back to San Francisco. And I think it was Pier 32 that they docked us off. I'm not, I wouldn't swear to that number, but it was there, along there. And when we got there, the Red Cross was there with coffee and cigarettes. There were 505 people on the ship when it sank. And we lost 23 out of that 505. Uh, the merchant 
captain lost his uh, much of his master's papers completely never got them back our skipper uh lost his right to command but he kept his rank of captain and stayed in the navy until he retired it's all had uh an after effect on on me the main thing i was as i said i'll never forget the name of that boat the flora and uh so now I'm going to skip ahead 55 years to the year 2005. My wife Caroline and I were at a uh, wedding out in Bodega Bay. And we uh, noticed on the program that there was a one of the wedding party. Her last name was Napoli. <clears throat> so we, Caroline went and found her after the ceremony was over. And brought her and introduced her to me. And we talked and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, we talked and talked and we were having trouble talking with other people, talking to us and coming around. So we started dancing. There was music playing. We danced and talked and her, her great, she knew that her great grandfather had been named John Angelo Napoli. She did not know him. He had died before she was born. He had died in, in uh, Terralinda in 1975. But anyway, she knew from family stories and such who he was and that his wife was named Flora. Connecting that with the name of that boat, I, I will be forever uh, convinced. I'll always know that I actually danced with John Angelo Napoli's <laughs> great granddaughter. <laughs> uh, a couple of couple of quick comments uh, about uh, Garland's story. Uh, this is a newspaper article, uh, at, and at first it was thought that there were uh, more fatalities than than there were. Uh, uh, this is a Mary looking back another picture of the bow of that ship. Uh, here's a picture of uh, benevolence a wash. It, it, it rolled over and sank, but the water three miles off of San Francisco is, is only 50 feet deep or so. So when the ship uh, rolled over and the, the uh, starboard side was on the bottom, uh, the port side was uh, very near the surface of the water, particularly at uh, low tide uh, and you can see in this picture uh, two of the lifeboats uh, still attached to the ship that are floating above it uh, here's another picture showing an aerial picture showing uh, the benevolence uh, just right beneath the surface of the water and you can see more lifeboats that are still attached to the ship there, there was not time to launch uh, lifeboats everyone on the ship that survived uh, jumped uh, or walked actually into the water and swam away as quickly as they could, thinking that when the ship went down, it would cause uh, a suction. Uh, here's another picture of survivors uh, arriving back in San Francisco uh, uh, on uh, probably a, probably an army ship. Uh, here's a picture of the nurses uh, that were aboard Benevolence that day. Uh, Garland mentioned the life jacket. The uh, World War II issue K-POC life jacket came with a crotch strap, which you put between your legs and fasten to keep the jacket from riding high uh, on your body or even slipping over your head. Uh, okay, let's get a picture here. The, the seamen uh, were all wearing dungarees and the officers, of course, trousers. The nurses that day were wearing their U.S. Navy issue three-quarter length wool skirts. Uh, <laughs> do we get a picture here of, uh, of a nurse str struggling into that kind of a life jacket uh, and then walking into the ocean? Uh, this is uh, <clears throat> uh, Wilma Ledbetter, Lieutenant Will of Wilma Ledbetter. She is the nurse who perished that day. Uh, she died actually of a heart attack uh, on board a rescue 
vessel after she had been uh, pulled from the water. Uh, this is the letter that her sister, who was her only uh, survivor, received from the Secretary of the Navy, offering his condolences to uh, her for the death of her sister in the, in the accident. Uh, and here is the, uh, the, the location of what's left of Benevolence, just about three miles off of the uh, cliff house, just south of the dredged deep water channel leading into the Golden Gate. Because the ship was a wash, uh, it kept getting hit by tugboats leaving San Francisco and headed south and by fishing boats. So two years after, in 1952, uh, Navy divers filled it with dynamite or some sort of explosive, uh, and they exploded it uh, to destroy it. Uh, and so littered on the bottom uh, in that location, uh, is the remains of uh, benevolence. Uh, and uh, I sailed my boat to Half Moon Bay in Monterey. Uh, I go to Half Moon Bay a couple times a year, uh, and I sail either over or very near uh, where uh, benevolence lies. Uh, there's another interesting story, maybe, uh, <laughs> that uh, the captain that day was not the captain who was going to take the boat to Korea. The captain that, who was going to take the boat, the ship to Korea, was on board uh, riding along. And once the ship had, had turned over, he made an attempt to go back down below to rescue uh, anyone who was trapped there. And he himself became trapped and perished uh, in, the, um, in the sinking. Uh, no memorial marks its resting place. And, not very many people, I think, know that the only American U.S. Navy hospital ship to sink uh, was not lost in battle, but was lost in a collision with a merchant ship just three or three or so miles uh, off of San Francisco. Um, now you do, and now everyone knows. And so that ends our quick journey through, uh, uh, what, 20, 25, if you don't count the 40 ships buried, ships out of all of those ships who came to San Francisco Bay uh, and stayed. There are dozens and dozens of other stories left to tell, but that will be another time. I want to thank uh, Franklin and Doug and Cheryl for in, inviting me and for helping me more than you know with getting this show on on the screen. I am not a computer person. Uh, so I thank you very much for uh, joining me uh, and I hope you found it uh, interesting. What an interesting talk and you know originally when we were talking about scheduling this this talk uh, Pat we Garland was alive. Yes. And we were hoping to have him be a co-presenter. And uh, yes, we were def desperately hoping for that, but uh, unfortunately, we we lost him. By the way, uh, Caroline, his wife, is also standing behind me and was enjoying Garland's uh, story with everyone else. <laughs> yes, uh, it, an incredible story, and all, equally incredible is how calm he stays uh, in the telling of it. I should have thought that that would have been very traumatic for everybody involved. <laughs> he seems so calm. Well, the, I don't know. It happened a, a long time ago, and uh, he's, I think he's probably told the story a few times. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a couple of questions, so let's get right to it. Uh, here's the first question from Jim, and Jim, you beat me to it uh, because I was wondering the same thing. And Pat, Jim would like to know, did the speaker mention how long, and that's Garland, he and his shipmen spent the night in the water on the night of the wreck? I mean, this is off San Francisco. The water is cold. Well, there, yes, uh, I, I, along with everything else, I have, uh, I, I have to renew my safety at sea certificate every couple of years. And uh, that involves uh, putting on a, a life jacket uh, and uh, with my foul weather gear on and, and jumping in the in the water, <laughs> uh, inflating the life jacket and floating around for a while. And I can tell you that even inside the bay, 
it is coal. We're told in the safety at sea training that uh, about 15 or 20 minutes in the water and you begin to experience hyperthermia, which is uh, which which begins with the inability to move parts of your body and, and that sort of thing. And maybe in 45 minutes or so, you uh, really become uh, unable to to help yourself. Uh, they floated around for about eight hours. Uh, it, it varied. The, the fog did not lift. Uh, look, the Mary looking back anchored. Uh, and kept blowing its uh, foghorn, and a fleet of uh, fishing boats, some came out from Fisherman's Wharf when they heard about the uh, incident. Others, like Nepali's boat, were coming back in, uh, and also small boats, army boat. The army had had quite a, quite a, quite a navy itself, small boats, and the, the Coast Guard uh, also came out uh, looking and picking up uh, survivors. Uh, Garland was, was back on board the Mary looking back just about dawn uh, the next day. So he spent seven, eight hours. It was six or so mess time for, for dinner when he went in the water. And it was sometime probably around two or three when uh, he was picked up by John Nepali. Uh, and they continued motoring around out there, picking up more. So there was a total of uh, 70 on board before he was able to get back to uh, the looking back where where he was given he was able to dry off and given some dry clothes by the by the crew on the boat which he was for his ship which he was um, you know happy about does that answer your question it's amazing that so many survived in the water for so long i've known people to die in 45 minutes well in the research that i have done the fatalities were, uh, for the most part, uh, folks trapped in the hull when, uh, when, it, when, when it went over. Uh, by the way, they, their bodies were removed by the, the, the Navy didn't have seals in, but it had a scuba uh, team. They, they, they removed the bodies before the ship was blown up. So uh, the ship itself is not a war, is not a grave uh, because the, it's assumed that there were no bodies left on, on the ship. And by the way, uh, Garland mentioned over 500 people on board. Uh, that number included quite a few civilians from Mare Island who had gone along on this shakedown cruise to make sure that everything was working correctly. Uh, and, uh, and so the, several of the, uh, of the people who perished were um, workers at, at, civilian workers at Mare Island. Mm. Huh. Well, I just want to. I just want to hold this up. Where can I get yes, it? Yes, I was. That was going to be my next question. You hold up the bomb. Sure. Those things that are sitting around the wreck, they're they're not live. They can't be ignited, right? No. Uh, this, like, yeah. I, I the screen is backwards. See the hole? That's where a, a, a ten gauge. Um, ah, there we go. That that was. Where a ten gauge flare was inserted, uh, and the flare was just a smoke flare. Okay. So when when it went off, it, it gave out a big plume of smoke, which the observers who were nearby in small boats could keep track of as they judged the bombing uh, capability of these young aviators. Remember that in the war, that young aviator was eighteen or nineteen years old. Uh, their, their training planes had sort of like a tube under the fuselage and they loaded eight of these things into that tube. And so when they went out, they left uh, the Naval Air Station here in Santa Rosa. They, they left uh, the Naval Station at uh, uh, Alameda, wherever they came from, uh, they would uh, drop eight of those bombs uh, and the squadron would be something like 16 planes so if you do your multiplication, uh, you know, there, you begin to know that there are tons of cast iron <laughs> uh, littered around that, that part of the bay. Wow. So if, I mean, I remember when I was exploring the Delta area and, and all around, it's very fun to drive around and, and see the different sloughs. And the, I ended up in Grizzly Bay and I looked across the bay and there seemed to me go to be ghost ships to me. I mean, these 
seem to be very old ships. I mean, where do, does the Navy put their decommissioned well, ships? Following World War II, there were, the Navy had literally thousands of ships. Remember, uh, there were 10,000 airplanes sitting in Southern California and Arizona ready to go to war. Uh, the, 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 the atomic bomb was not in the picture when the planning occurred. And uh, it, with, with what had happened on Okinawa and Iwo, Iwo Jima, uh, the War Department, uh, aptly named the War Department, became the Defense the War Department, uh, projected one million American casualties to capture the Japanese main islands. Uh, and by the way, that's that's why uh, Benevolence and her sister ships uh, were built. They were built originally as freighters, uh, but converted to uh, hospital ships. And that's why this incident really happened, because hospital ships that were designed from the keel up had double hulls. So that if the uh, looking back had peeled back the outer hull, there would have been an inner hull that would have uh, probably saved the ship from sinking. But these freighters were single hull vessels, which were in an emergency converted to hospital ships. Uh, when the war was over, the Navy had uh, thousands of, of ships. Uh, a lot of them, many of them were sold uh, to be victory ships, liberty ships, uh, not the warships, were sold to uh, shipping companies, uh, that sort of thing. But it was thought prudent to hang on to a, a lot of them and, and also to some warships. So um, reserve fleets were established at various places around the United States. And the reserve fleet in Sassoon Bay was one of those. These ships were taken up. They were mothballed uh, and with a, the thought that if another war occurred, uh, the Navy would be better equipped with ships. Uh, and uh, it uh, actually, uh, benevolence was not laid up in Sassoon Bay. It was mothballed and kept right at Mare Island. Uh, but the other ships were lined up in, in, uh, Mare, uh, in Sassoon Bay uh, and more or less maintained. Crews kept, they, they chipped and painted. Uh, they were kept warm uh, inside with uh, furnaces to prevent uh, moisture from doing that. But it, it really turned out not to be very practical. Uh, and uh, the ships that are left up there are one by one being culled out and, and towed uh, to a breaking yard where they're uh, recycled into uh, uh, Toyotas or Kias or uh, so, something like that. I have a final question for you, sir. Do any of these ghost ships have ghosts? On them, have there are any hauntings? It's a, it's, it's a coincidence that we're doing this in October. Yes, uh, it, was just, it was supposed to be what in April or something like that. Yeah. Uh, well, no, it, there's no Winchester Mystery House ship. Uh, there, uh, the, 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 the ghost ship is, is a, uh, a ship that sails the seas after the crew has abandoned it or it's been sunk or something like that in term in in marine terminology it is it is not it is not a ship that uh, has uh, uh, spirits well you know it used to have spirits on on board they were kept in bottles liquid ones <laughs> but, but uh, it, no the ghost ship is is a term used for a, a ship that uh, sails on even though it's been sunk or abandoned or uh, something like that Okay. Well, that was a wonderful presentation. And thank you so much for reaching out to offer it. And thank you to Doug. Where, you might as well put your little face in there, Doug. Come let us see you. Now I know who to look for when I want to come tour the, the Ferry Ukiah at the Maritime Museum in San Francisco. Eureka, Ferry Eureka. Eureka. Well, once Eureka, now Eureka. That's right. right. Originally Eureka, but rebuilt as Eureka. Right. So, okay. Well, I'm going to, before we close, I would like to say um, for those of you who have enjoyed our weekly email history vignettes composed by local historian Chuck Olenberg, 
You'll be pleased to hear that those vignettes have been bound into a new book called Mill Valley History Vignettes, Volume 2. Uh, it's a compilation of 152 of Chuck's most recent vignettes. Volume 2 makes a wonderful companion to Chuck's original book, Mill Valley History Vignettes, which continues to be available in our Mill Valley Historical Society bookstore. So both of them are. And also available, our bookstore is available online at our website. Also available is Adventures of Two Coast Miwok Children, written by, by my dear friend and fellow board member, Betty Girk. This beautiful book brings alive Marin County's Coast Miwok legacy as it explores the daily lives of a real boy and girl who lived in neighboring villages on San Francisco Bay in the late 1700s. The little boy in the story is named Huik Musa, but he would grow up to be known as Chief Marin, Marin County's namesake. It's a precious and truly beautiful book and a great gift for children and adults. So that about wraps it up. A special thanks again to our speaker, Pat Broderick and to Doug Ford. And I'm so glad we were able to include Garland's video. That was beautiful. Um, uh, special thanks also to the audience for your interest in patronage. I hope you'll join us next month, that's November 2nd, 2022, as we turn the history lens towards music for the next couple of months. And the November 2nd talk will be a reminiscence of Prune Music Store. Some of you may recall that Prune Music Store was located on Locust Street in Mill Valley next to Brothers Tavern and was a gathering place for local Bay Area musicians and music enthusiasts, enthusiasts in the late 1960s and 70s. The talk is titled Prune Music, So Much More Than a Music Store, and our guests will be founders David Kessner and Randy Smith, Smith along with co-owners Bill Steele and Larry Craig. So till then, be well and good night.